questions. Okay, very good. Um, so welcome to everyone joining us here on this Zoom meeting and also on the YouTube live stream. Um, this is the chemistry session uh, with the student speakers, um, part of the varsity scheme. And um, we'll have seven interesting student presentations which lasts around 10 to 12 minutes, uh, followed by a Q and A. Um, you can ask questions either in this meeting here on Zoom um, by raising your hand or by writing in the comments section um, or in the comments on YouTube. And um, we'll kick it off with our first student speaker, Min Fei, Fei. Um, he's a second year PhD student at the Department of Materials Science and Metallurgy. And um, he presents something which he worked on in collaboration with Nankai University and Nanjing University. And without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Okay, thanks, Tristan. So uh, I will just start my uh, presentation with a very brief introduction. So as, as Tristan just introduced, I'm a second year, uh, actually beginning to be a serious student uh, at Cambridge Department of Material Science and Metallurgy. So I am uh, working on uh, lithium batteries and as well as lithium battery safety monitoring and management. So today my presentation will be on the anode side, anode design in the lithium based batteries. So um, probably everyone is very familiar with lithium ion battery. Lithium ion battery has a history of uh, slightly less than three decades. So lithium ion battery, current lithium ion battery was actually um, part, partly introduced by uh, Professor John B. Good enough, uh, 2019 chemical Nobel Prize winner. Uh, and then this lithium ion battery was first commercialized in the early 1990s. And since its first commercialization, it uh, very quickly um, introduced very uh, rapid development in the portable device market. We can see in the two, uh, two charts, um, the growth rate for lithium ion battery global market is increasing um, by a 10% or even 12% uh, annual growth rate every year. So it's really a huge demand flow for, for the global market. And we can see lithium ion batteries can power uh, a lot of devices. For example, everyone, probably everyone will use their cell phones uh, every day. And actually the battery is lithium ion battery. Uh, and probably most people rely on uh, their laptops um, to, to connect, to, to deal with some works and maybe to do remote studying. And uh, electric vehicles are becoming more and more popular in some parts of the world. And currently, the battery is also lithium ion battery. And maybe uh, many people like playing video games just like I did. So, also, lithium ion battery powers this uh, video game players and uh, maybe music. So, in our headphones, lithium ion batteries powers our headphones. So, so one can very hard to imagine if we can really spend a day in this modern society without the presence of a lithium ion battery. However, there are huge limitations for the lithium ion battery. Uh, presently, um, the commercial anode used for lithium ion battery is graphite anode, but we can see graphite anode has a very low ther theoretical capacity of 372 milliamp hour per gram, but, uh, but uh, we already achieved 360 to 365 milliampere per hour per gram uh, currently. So it means we really have very little to improve for the current um, graphite inode, which means we, are really, we really need to look for a better anode to fit in this uh, ever higher demand of energy usage. So here comes lithium metal anode and a silicon anode. Uh, both anodes have a much higher theoretical capacity compared to graphite anode, um, like 10 times you can see. So lithium metal anode has a theoretical capacity of 3,800 milliamp hour per gram, 
while silicon anode has slightly higher theoretical capacity. So due to their higher capacity, they are receiving more and more attention as the potential can candidates to replace the um, graphite anode. So uh, let's take a closer look for this metal anode. This metal anode has the most negative potential. Uh, why the most negative potential is good for a lithium anode? Because we know uh, when, the, when the potential, uh, the more negative the potential is, means the, the iron grabs more energy, means the iron is more reactive. So it means lithium metal anode is very reactive. So the reaction is very easy to happen. So we, we can't even imagine if we put uh, maybe a silver, anode in a battery because it is very, very difficult to react. react. And it just, just as we mentioned, it has a much higher theoretical capacity than the current graphite anode. However, there is also a very huge problem that is the uncontrollable dendrite growth. We can see from this graph. So when the lithium anode, metal anode coupled into a lithium ion battery and upon cycling, the lithium dendrite just uh, just become more and more sharp. And finally, it will penetrate through the separator, cause the cathode side and anode side to connect with each other, causing a very huge safety problem. We had probably heard quite a lot of um, news on lithium ion battery ca causing a huge fire. Um, this, is, this is very true uh, with every device and probably more often with electrical vehicles. But there are also some possible methods to tackle with the wide grown lithium metal dendrites. The first one is using an all solid state battery. It means we don't have liquid electrolyte here. The separator is, uh, is a layer of a hard solid state. It can just physically penetrate, uh, uh, physically um, suppress the lithium dendrites to pass through the separator. Also, we can do electrolyte engineering. It means we add some electrolyte additive into the liquid electrolyte, and the electrolyte additive will react on the anode side to form a stable layer to, to also physically and chemically to help reduce the lithium dendrites. The so separate engineering is a bit similar. Um, separate engineering means we do some engineering on the separator side. It can either physically or chemically um, help tackle the, tackle the lithium anode dendrite. And also we can try to use an electro, electrode protection film to, uh, to be fixed on the lithium anode. This is uh, from a physical perspective. It's, it's very easy to imagine. So if we put a physical film, then the lithium dendrite is also, it's, it's, it will act uh, just like a additional protection layer for the separator, so it also protects the separator. And here's uh, some previous studies I will just discuss very briefly. So uh, I just tried to think, uh, so this work was focused on separate engineering. I just synthesized a new separator, use a very low cost green and a scalable synthesis method. And we can see from the EDS mapping, so every element, uh, the elemental distribution is very homogeneous. It means the, uh, the material is, 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 uh, was prepared very homogeneously. And from the BET measurement, we can see the pore size is very small very small than the traditional seal guard, commercial seal guard separator. And also it has a very, uh, it has a much higher um, specific surface area, which means it provides much more reaction spots for the lithium ions to pass through the separator. So combined with the pore size, um, the, the separator with different pore size morphologies will, um, will greatly help the lithium ions to diffuse more homogeneously and arrive at the lithium metal anode more adequately to reduce the lithium dendrite growth. And we can also see the, the new separator, the green line has a much, uh, has, uh, can stand up to 43% of 
uh, elastic deformation. So its 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 physical property is really good, and it can it can be operated above 160 degrees degree C, which is um, pretty good for the normal battery operating temperature range. And we can and uh, and actually this uh, new separator has a terminal functional groups which can be easily transformed between the separator and to couple with the lithium ions in the liquid electrolyte. Uh, we can see from the FDIR and the UV VIS measurements. So the terminal bonding group is easily, uh, is, is highly flexible, both with the separator and the lithium, I lithium ions. Uh, and also this separator with the presence of this terminal functional group has about uh, three times higher ionic conductivity for the whole battery. It means um, it can um, it will transform the lithium ions more easily. And we can see the contact angle measurements. So for the new separator, so that when the electrolyte when when the liquid electrolyte dip onto the uh, new separator surface. It means uh, there is uh, very much a, a much better immersion. Uh, in the case, there is a much lower surface resistance, and this is very this will be very good for a more uniform solid electrolyte interface on the this metal anode side. And here are more uh, images. So this is a a laser laser ion beam spectroscopy reviews also the uh, uniform. Uh, distribution of different elements. And here is a very interesting in situ optical microscope. We can see from EFG, so F has more terminal groups than E, G has slightly more terminal groups than F. We can see with more terminal groups, so the lithium deposition is more uniform and the lithium dendrites can be tackled more easily. And here is the separator just received. This is the separator. Um, after immersion into the electrolyte for 24 hours, this is the uh, new separator immersed into the new uh, blank electrolyte for 48 hours. And we can see from AFM images, the structural stability is quite quite good. We can also see from the lithium lithium symmetric cell, the new separator is really good for tackling uh, the short circuit problems. The short circuit problems is actually generally caused by the lithium dendrite growth and penetrating the separator. So it means it's really protective for the separator, both under uh, small current densities and high current densities. And this, these three figures just show it can couple very good with lithium sulfur battery system with the very promising uh, lithium phosphate, a uh, lithium ion phosphate battery system and the lithium LTO battery system. Uh, here we comes to the silicon-based anode. So silicon is very cheap and very environmental friendly, and it is the second abundant element in Earth's crust, just next to oxygen, and it has a very high theoretical capacity, even higher than the uh, lithium metal anode. But uh, there are also huge problems for its uh, real application. For example, it has a very huge volume expansion. Imagine your battery, you are using a fixed volume battery, but your anode just uh, expands three, more than three times uh, when you use it. So this is really horrible and will cause very severe uh, safety problems. And it has a very low initial columbic efficiency. This is means, um, and this is roughly 70% first cycle columbic efficiency. It means 30% of its theoretical capacity um, forever gone, so it's really bad for the long cycling. And uh, its solid electrolyte interface formation mechanism is still very unclear. So here, this studies, this is a study from a, uh, from a cooperative institution, and uh, they, they, they uh, use the silicon anode to, uh, to couple with part of the uh, germanium and to, um, to form an alloy so the alloy you can see will, will be really great to help uh, increase the first cycle columbic efficiency. And this is the second work uh, I am involved in. So second work is to use 
silicon-based anode, silicon oxide, not silicon. Silicon oxide will help to reduce the volume expansion problem. And then we put another surface layer, so graphene, outside of the silicon oxide to further protect this uh, anode materials. And from DFT calculation, so when silicon oxide carbon bonding is formed by this silicon uh, silicon uh, ox oxygen uh, coated with graphene, we can see the uh, energy barrier is much is much lower, which means it's more favorable for the for the lithium ions to be inserted into the into this silicon based anode. So this this work is in a, a final stage, and hopefully we can finish this co work soon. And lastly, I want to thank my uh, supervisors, Professor Fasan Kuma, K. Ducati, and Manish Chuala, and also other uh, collaborators across, actually across the world. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks so much for this very interesting presentation. Um, that's really cool because um, you were touching on the exact same topics which Stanley Withingham, our previous speaker, already kind mm -hmm. of introduced. So you gave a you gave a much more like broad kind of picture to it, which is really cool and um, also nice to see that there is like that this is still a very active research area, even though the first battery has been invented in the seventies. So that's really cool. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'll just kick off the, the questions. Um, the question which I also asked uh, Stanley Withingham. Um, do you think there is like even though there's a lot to improve with those lithium batteries and we can still push the boundaries and the capacities um, even higher, but do you think we'll need to switch to some sort of new, completely new battery design at some point? Or do you think we- So, so, with lithium? so, so actually I think for the next, maybe next decade, we, we still need to stick to the lithium ion batteries, but already there are some, some uh, major market players in this world, uh, maybe in Asia or in, in Japan or in some countries. So they are already commercialized sodium ion batteries. So sodium ion batteries, uh, they, they use sodium ion batteries to be a good additive for the lithium ion batteries. Because you know, uh, in some cold weather, Cut, cut, cut off like nearly half 50 percent so uh, if we use sodium ion batteries it will be uh, really uh, good in, a, in in some very cold weather or in some uh, some some extreme weathers so sodium ion batteries will be a good additive for lithium ion batteries but I don't think it will replace lithium ion batteries and uh, also some people propose zinc ion batteries but zinc ion batteries can be used in a uh, aqueous based electrolyte system. So when we say aqueous based, it means it's very easy for this person and it's really good for environmental protection. So either sodium ion battery or a lithium ion battery use some a bit of toxic electrolyte. So it's actually a bit uh, po poisonous for the environment. So it needs some special recycling process, but not actually for the zinc ion batteries. So, but in terms of real application, this ion battery is still the market dominator for the portable device market. I don't mean for the whole energy market, but for the portable device market. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. And if we switch the um, organic solvent to, uh, to a water-based um, electrolyte, um, there's certainly like a range the voltage range you can have is much smaller. Uh, so how does that, like, what, what kind of disadvantage does that bring? Um, and would water-based applications rather be very large-scale storage systems like flow batteries? Uh, so, uh, so, 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 sorry, which, which volume becomes smaller, you mean? Um, I mean, if you, if you replace the organic solvent by water um, yes. in your battery, you have a smaller window because the water decomposes yes, at yes. like much yes, earlier yes, than the true. organic one. Yeah, so, so would that yeah. rather be an application for large scale um, storage systems? Because so, obviously the energy distance, um, yeah. 
Yeah, I I understand. Not only the the narrow potential window, but also some maybe a uh, hydrogen evolution reactions, oxygen reduction reaction, side reactions will happen, right? But we can try to uh, make the electrolyte more dense. Uh, for example, we use one mole of uh, some electrolyte, and then we use maybe 20 more of this electrolyte. This will push the boundaries of the potential window, make the potential window wider for a real application. Um, also, we can try to maybe to play around with the pH for the aqueous based batteries to just avoid some side reactions to happen. Um, but you are right, they need some additional efforts and sometimes it's really expensive and not mature technology. So they can't replace the aqueous based electrolyte can't fully replace replace the uh, the 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 organic electrolyte at the moment. That is kind of a direction. All right, thank you very much, and thanks so much for your presentation. Um, with that, we'll go over to our next speaker, um, Saksham Kapoor, um, who is a second year Natsuki, just starting a second year. And he did a summer research project at CITIID. And he'll tell us something about um, XNAs. And I've never heard it before, so I'm, I'm also very curious to find out. Um, yeah, I'll hand over to you. Hi, can you see my screen? I'm just checking, I'm not sure. Yeah, you see it. Brilliant. Uh, Brilliant. Uh, thank you all for coming. And today I'll be talking about XNA and the use of XNA in designing molecular scissors to target RNA. So uh, as you mentioned, my name's Aksham, I'm a second year Natsuki, and over the summer, I spent some time here in Cambridge uh, doing research on xenonucleic acids. So xenonucleic acids are synthetic nucleic acids. Uh, the two nucleic acids found in nature, DNA and RNA, follow a general structure of a sugar phosphate backbone containing either deoxyribose or ribose respectively. And these are attached to nitrogenous bases, which encode information. In contrast, XNAs are a novel class of synthetic nucleic acids comprising sugars or occasionally bases with alternative chemistries not found in nature. The real benefits of XNA based on nucleotides derived from their synthetic nature, derive, uh, having evolved in the absence of such synthetic nucleic acids. Life has not seen the production of XNA capable exonucleases as a justifiable use of resources. And what this means is that XNA oligos have a greater biostability than natural nucleic acids. And you can see this in figure one, where the synthetic phanazine has a much slower degradation than the natural DNA zyme. Additionally, there is reduced immunogenicity for XNA based oligos compared to natural nucleic acids, again, because of the non natural nature. And it's these benefits that have been exploited in antisense oligonucleotide therapies. But today I'm going to be focusing much more on the use of XNA in enzymes. So XNA can be formed into polynucleotides and they can form XNA zymes, uh, which are non proteinaceous enzymes. And this is due to a few properties. Firstly, XNA polynucleotides are able to fold in secondary structures like hairpins which gives them catalytic activity in a manner analogous to ribosomes, which are RNA-based enzymes. We can see this in figure three, where reactions were set up with a one to 100 ratio of XNA zyme to substrate. And therefore, the percentage decrease in substrate intensity corresponded to the number of turnovers on average that each enzyme had done. Therefore, for example, a 5% degradation would indicate that each XNA zyme had caused five catalytic events to occur. And the fact that we see significantly more than 1% substrate degradation indicates 
that each individual exonazine is making multiple reactions happen and therefore they are true catalysts. Secondly, exonase is able to bind to DNA or RNA using what's in quick phase pairing rules. And that means that synthesis of the desired XNA strand is possible from a template of DNA. And we use this in the lab to produce specific exonazines for assays. Also, the ability of XNA to bind to RNA in this way allows for exonazines to be directed to a specific cut site within an RNA sequence by the use of binding arms that are complementary to the regions of the RNA either side of this cut site. So we can produce exonazines through a process of directed evolution. Um, and we start off this process with a diverse pool of exonase sequences bound in cysts to the target RNA that they're trying to cleave. And these can be produced from DNA templates. So here we have a diverse pool of exonazines, and we incubate these chimeras uh, in a reaction buffer at 37 degrees. So that strands with an XNA sequence that allows them to fold into RNA endonucleases are able to then cleave off this target RNA, resulting in a shortening of the chimera strand. The use of 37 degrees as a temperature and a reaction buffer that mimics physiological pH and iron concentration is a deliberate choice that means that all of the enzymes we evolve in this process are capable of not only functioning well in vitro, but hopefully as well in vivo. And that paves the way to potential use as therapeutics. So I mentioned how some of our enzymes with the correct sequences will be able to cleave off the target RNA, resulting in a shortening and some won't. Well, we can separate these out in a page gel and then extract out the shorter chimeras using a XNA dependent DNA reverse transcriptase to produce DNA templates, which can then be amplified further. We can then take those DNA templates and use them to resynthesize a pool of exonazine, but this will be a much smaller pool. And we repeat this process multiple times. Each time, though, we shorten the incubation period. And what this does is it creates a selection pressure, um, a selection pressure that then uh, leads the exonazines with the sequences that make them faster cutting um, being selectively amplified. Whereas the slowest exonazines in the short incubation period won't be able to cleave off their target RNA. And therefore, these will gradually be eliminated from the process. Eventually, after several rounds of the selections with progressively shorter incubation periods, uh, we'll see an increase in proportion of the fastest exonazines. And these will finally be ready for uh, sequencing and assaying. So in my project, I was using uh, exonazine to target a new class of RNA that hadn't been seen before. Uh, and that is extracellular glycosylated RNA, which is found in the outside of some cells. Uh, in particular, a class of RNA called Y-RNAs make up the greatest proportion of RNAs that end up being glycosylated. And these have been implicated in autoimmune conditions like lupus, which means that having a tool to edit these types of RNAs could aid further work in the area and potentially even lead to therapeutics. Now, typically, to break down RNA, we can also use uh, a method called RNA interference, but that involves a multi-protein uh, complex called RISC, and the thought of assembling such a complex uh, protein on the outside of the cell seems far more complicated than just having a single exonazine. enzyme. In addition, given the extracellular RNA is postulated to have a role in signaling, the greater biostability of an exonazine could lead to a more prolonged knockdown of RNA levels, thereby disrupting signaling more effectively than RNA So to produce uh, the phanazines, which uh, was the chemistry, by the way, that we used to target our RNA, um, we have a template here in blue of DNA, which is biotinylated. And we used a P3-row primer, which is a chimera of blue DNA and one single RNA nucleotide. A DNA-dependent banner polymerase then incorporates banner nucleotide triphosphates uh, in a manner complementary to the DNA strand to produce a duplex. And this can then be purified by removing uh, the spare polymerase from the spare banner nucleotide triphosphates. A low concentration hydroxide treatment is then used to separate the two strands by breaking hydrogen bonds between them. And then we can raise the concentration of hydroxide 
and that will essentially cause this one RNA nucleotide to cleave off the P2E very primer, giving us just our 37 like pure phanazine. And that can be further purified by running up the gel, extracting it, and then causing epitopes of patients. So in this way, we produce four enzymes targeting four different cut sites in our RNA substrate. All four phanazines were 37 nucleotides long with two 10 nucleotide binding arms and a 37 nucleotide catalytic core. Rather than using directed evolution to produce our catalytic core, we were inspired by previous selections against the Ebola virus genome. And while that did lead to a slightly lower turnover rate in our uh, exonazines than they could potentially have had, it was a trade off that saved us five months of those selections. And that was ultimately a trade off that we chose was worth it because this aim of the project was more about developing a tool to cleave a new class of RNA rather than developing the most effective tool. So we tested our enzymes by having five to one uh, ratio incubations of five to one being five parts exonazine, one part substrate. And these were run for 20 hours and zero hours taxes controlled. And then we ran them on a page gel. What we, what we saw then is that phanazine D was effective at cleaving the substrate, resulting in the production of two cervical product bands which aren't present in the controls. And then we decided to improve the rate potentially by modifying our enzyme D. Uh, so we're, there were a couple of changes that we made in order to do this. Um, and mainly there were two point mutations. Uh, but we also had initially in enzyme D a, pair, a GC pairing between the substrates and the enzyme. We mutated this G to a T to introduce a mismatch. And then we also mutated what was previously a C to an A. And by doing so, we disincentivized binding of this residue uh, to the substrate and incentivized it to bind to another region of catalytic core, thereby extending the stem by one nucleotide because this was something that we'd seen in previous selections had led to an improved rate. Um, and this was something that, you know, we confirmed with structural modeling as well um, online. And so we also then went and produced another enzyme E to target a fifth cut site, uh, just so that we could have a bit of variety. And 20 hour incubations of these showed that actually the rates of cutting was approximately doubled in modified D, which made sense uh, given you know what we've looked at and it was what we expected, but we unfortunately didn't see any cutting in D. We then went on to characterize our uh, enzyme mod D by setting up set of time points. So eight tubes of two microleaf reactions were set up in a thermal cycler, and tubes were removed at regular intervals uh, and quenched with loading buffer. Loading buffer contains formamide which acts to disrupt the secondary structure of our phanazines, thereby preventing any further cleavage of the product. And so essentially we could stop the reaction from happening by adding this loading buffer at regular intervals to different tubes. And that way we could monitor the percentage of substrate degraded over time and calculate kinetic parameters. As expected, we saw a plateauing of our substrate cleavage uh, at 96 hours. And you can see that plateauing also happening here with the product and intensity, whereby we see an initial increase sort of leveling out. And then finally, we wanted to confirm that we were indeed cutting our RNA where we expected. Um, the cut site we had targeted would have yielded, if correctly cut, a 56 nucleotide into 28 nucleotide product. So we created a ladder from partial digests of the 30 nucleotide RNA sequence. Um, by using a low hydroxide concentration, we have on average one SNP per RNA molecule. And so we produce a ladder uh, containing bands of 30 nucleotides, 29 nucleotides, all the way down to one. When we ran this on a gel with an incubation, we saw that the 28 nucleotide band aligned with our smaller product, thereby confirming that we were indeed cutting where we expected. Uh, thank you all for listening. Um, thank you all to the Taylor Lab for having me. Uh, in their lab and supporting me with this project. And yeah, if you have any questions, I'll be able to take them. All right, thank you very much for this very um, great talk. Um, I'd have a question just to kick things off um, about the application of your technology. Um, could this maybe be used to, to um, 
produce messenger RNA for vaccines or something? Um, so, yeah, so I guess the idea with XNA in that sort of situation might be more introducing XNA with the whole assembly of, you know, protein synthesis machinery, but that would be quite complicated. Um, you know, these XNA times are about cleaving RNA. Um, and, you know, these COVID vaccines are introducing RNA. If you introduce XNA times or XNA sequences, would that really lead to production of a spike protein in cells? Probably uh, not. Um, you know, you have to develop a whole sort of framework for that, and it would be quite challenging. Uh, but, you know, in the future, it could possibly be that maybe XNA could replace RNA in vaccines, uh, but it's not something that's, you know, ready to go at the moment. Could you maybe use it to, to cleave the, the messenger RNA when you manufacture the vaccine in the lab? Oh, yes. Sorry. Right. Uh, yeah. So XNA enzymes are pretty effective at targeting RNA, as we've seen. Um, so certainly, yeah, if there was a stage in production where you needed to chop off, uh, you know, some fragment of RNA to produce a finished uh, product to be injected, uh, yeah, I think XNA enzymes could work well in that, and they do benefit from that increased biostability um, as compared to ribozymes. Um, and they do also mean that, you know, you wouldn't be introducing something that could be viewed by someone's immune system if it wasn't possible to extract that in some sort of downstream process. So there is potential. Um, sure. Great, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll pass on to Ariman who wants to ask the question. Yeah, so just want to add on to that question. So for example, some people have long lasting effects of uh, get, when they get infected, infected by viruses, for example, with COVID as well, because of the, uh, because the, the proteins that are encoded by the DNA of the virus, this this they're still they're still active, right? So can mm -hmm. we use XN enzymes to attack those RNAs that have been encoded by the viral DNA, and how you can actually treat the uh, the viral infection if it's uh, if it like for example while you're waiting for the vaccine, like just for example. Um. Yes. So I'd, I'd like to think anything where you could break down RNA is something that XNA could be applied to. Um, obviously, we benefit from not triggering immune responses. Uh, and that is obviously one of the benefits uh, to what we're doing here. Um, would it work in, you know, trying to break down someone's uh, some, some sort of virus infecting a cell? Would it try to break down those RNAs? In theory, yeah, it should work. But I mean, obviously, there's so many challenges with developing something, uh, especially if you're putting it into humans that, um, you know, I can't say with any guarantee it will work. But what I can say is that targeting RNA is possible with XNA. Uh, we've shown that with these enzymes uh, in previous work in the lab that's really uh, been focusing on that and developing more efficient enzymes. Uh, so, yeah, I'd, I'd like to think um, that this could one day end up in some sort of therapeutic. Um, but yeah, it's a little bit of a way to go. Thanks. Right, yeah, um, good luck with that. And uh, we'll hand over to our next speaker. Thank you very much. Um, um, yeah, the next speaker is Pip Knight. She's um, on the CAMSOC committee. She's a um, incoming third year at Churchill College. And she'll talk about her work at the um, materials department, I think, over the summer. But yeah, we'll, we'll hear more from, from Pip. Awesome. Thank you very much. So yeah, I've been working in the materials department this summer um, and most of my work has been centred on synthesising and modelling indium nanoparticles um, in the optical nanomaterials group. So these indium nanoparticles are what we call zero dimensional particles. And if you synthesise them correctly, they're highly faceted. Um, and the shapes that you get are quite interesting and they haven't really been modeled to date. Um, and they've kind of been spotted in synthesis and papers, odds like references to a triangle or an octahedron, but uh, a kind of rigorous model is yet to be done. So that's what I've been working on this summer. And the, the shapes that you get are dependent on a few different factors. So the first of those is obviously the crystal structure. Um, indium crystallizes in a body-centered tetragonal structure, which I'm showing on the top right-hand image. So it's essentially a cubic array with a lattice point in the middle, and then you stretch it out in the z-direction, and you get a tetragonal lattice. 
And another factor that will impact on the shapes you get is the energies of the surface facets, um, which can vary a lot. So usually you've got a few that are low energy and so larger to minimize your overall energy. If it's a kinetics dominated process then growth velocities become important, or um, if you have things like re-entrant surfaces, those often grow a bit quicker. Um, so that can be a factor. And finally, twinning. Uh, which is shown in the bottom right. That's basically a mirror plane uh, in your crystal structure, and that's a growth defect, um, but it leads to different shapes, which are quite obviously mirrored as well. So um, they're a bit symmetric in that respect. So before I delve into these shapes that I've been modeling, I thought I would tell you a little bit about what you can actually do with indium nanoparticles. So it doesn't seem too abstract. Um, and before I go into the applications, another reason that I've been studying indium is just as a kind of demonstration of the body-centered tetragonal crystal system. So the group has covered face-centered cubic, body-centered cubic, and hexagonal close-packed structures before and studied some systems for those. But because tetragonal systems are a bit more unusual, um, they haven't been covered yet. So I thought that that would be an interesting thing to model and find out about these shapes via indium. So indium nanoparticles can be used for tribology as a lubricant um, mixed with oil. They can be used for catalysis. Um, and it's especially important for catalysis that we gain this knowledge about what shapes indium nanoparticles are because things like edges are very advantageous for catalysis. They're highly active, they've got low coordination numbers there. So very good for binding substrates. Um, and twinning is also, um, as a defect, twin planes can be active uh, sites for catalysis. So, and the, the third um, application for indium is in something called plasmonics, which might not be familiar to all of you, but the next slide covers it a little bit more. It's basically an optical response of electrons. And that has applications in quite a lot of different fields, including cancer therapy, um, chemical sensors, and you can also enhance catalysis rates with plasmonics. So if you decorate a nanoparticle catalyst with something that's plasmonic and shine the right frequency, then you can generate some high electric fields and enhance your catalysis. So what I'm showing here is um, an electric field. So we've got light passing by that yellow nanoparticle in the center there. And the nanoparticle, because it's um, generally smaller than the wavelength of this light, the electrons are approximately feeling the same phase of the light at the same time. And they're undergoing this collective oscillation of the surface electrons. So it's called a localized surface plasma resonance when it's in the nanoscale and on the surface. And this only occurs for certain metals and metal oxides um, that have, it's basically, an equation and some math. They need specific um, real and imaginary parts of their dielectric function to resonate in this way. But luckily, indium does. So that made it another nice thing to study for me, um, the fact that I could pick this metal and not only synthesize the nanoparticles and have a look at them, but also shine some lasers on them and get excited about what they do when, when you do that. <laughs> so before I go into any more detail on these stages, I thought I would give you a little bit of chronology about um, my summer and the kind of steps I went through in the journey. Um, so I started off in Christmas, actually, with just briefly looking at this project um, remotely on MATLAB. So I started doing the wolf modeling for the BCT crystal system. When I say wolf modeling, that's basically just a, a fairly simple theorem that you, it's four single crystals and you can apply it to twins in a slightly different way. And I generated some shapes that I would expect with um, single twinning or fivefold twinning. And then I actually created these particles in the lab over the summer and tried to match up these shapes and tried to find out what, what the low energy facets were under different solvent conditions with different ligands. So, once I'd done that, the obvious next step was to fully characterize these particles because there's no good sort of saying it looks vaguely cubic, vaguely octahedral. You want to know exactly what that surface facet is in order to match it back to the Wolf model. Um, so electron diffraction is very useful for that. And then I took a look at the plasmonic response uh, using UV-vis spectroscopy and hyperspectral imaging. 
And then I also modeled that numerically um, using something called DDA, which is the discrete dipole approximation. Um, I haven't finished this part, but I am doing some density functional theory or about the surfaces and the twin planes. And finally, the catalysis is the real application of all of this. I didn't actually do it for indium, but I did, the second half of my internship was all about uh, magnesium decorations on palladium catalysts. So I don't particularly have time to cover all of that, um, but I will cover the shapes and the synthesis in a, in a bit more detail. Um, and you can see some pretty pictures, so I'm sure that'll be enjoyable. So the wolf models, here are some shapes for you. So the left-hand images, the green images are single crystals. Um, and I've basically just stabilized different facets between those three images. The one on the right is a rod. So they get a lot longer than that um, when you actually synthesize them. They're going up in the Z direction. And then top right-hand corner, you've got the single twins, which are generally triangular or a bit truncated. And in the bottom right, you have a decahedron. Um, and it's definitely my favorite shape. It's just very pretty. And I also found it quite exciting to model. Um, and I'll explain why on this slide. So the decahedron is made up of five twin segments. So in the left-hand image, in the center of these lines, going into the, into the page are twin planes. Um, so the one, zero, one, you go, go along and you mirror there and then you continue on to the next mirror plane, the 011 and you mirror, and then you go along to the next mirror plane and so on. Um, so the fact that this can actually happen and form a kind of closed um, fivefold pattern is that these angles between the 101 and 011 are very, very close to 72.42, to 72 degrees. They're actually 72.42. And so they only need a small amount of strain to form a space filling model. And I'm showing on the right hand side um, the actual crystal structure and those 101 and 011 planes. And you can see that if you change your C over A ratio um, for your tetragonal system, that angle is going to change. So if you stretch it out more, um, that angle would get larger and essentially you would end up having um, more strain and eventually it would, it would reach a point that these decahedra are not stable anymore. So when I was doing this modeling over Christmas, I was quite excited to find that indium has this lattice parameter ratio that allows this shape to form because a lot of other um, BCT systems don't. Um, so I started off by calculating the, the angles for um, beta 10 and I was like, oh, it's way off. No way that's going to make a decahedron. But when I got to indium and it all suddenly worked, I was really excited. And then even more excitingly, um, it worked in the lab as well. So that's a decahedron there. Um, and I've just marked on those twin planes for you to make it a bit more obvious. So they're 101 type. Um, and there we go. Yeah. Um, here's how you make the indium nanoparticles, essentially just reduce indium three to indium zero. Probably don't have too much time to chat about that. Um, lots, and here are some more of the particles and some SEM images matched up with the Wolf models. Here's just a brief slide about the effect of the length of your ligand on what shapes you get. So I found it quite interesting when I was playing with polyvinyl pyrrolidine as a ligand, which is a very good ligand for nanoparticle synthesis. It's very stabilizing. The fact that um, as you increase the chain length of this ligand, you start to stabilize different facets. So you stabilize 101 far above anything else. And then when you have the shorter chains, you stabilize 0, 0, 001, 1, 1, 0 a bit more. So you get these truncated shapes um, on the bottom right-hand corner. So I thought that was quite interesting and um, potentially something that could be explored more with density functional theory, um, see if that matches up a bit. And then another effect I found of these very long Lincoln chains was the fact that I got a lot of small spheres um, compared to the other two syntheses. And that's because as you can see on this top right-hand graph, the ligand is a lot longer than the spherical nanoparticle. So it can definitely wrap all the way around, can tangle at the ends and you get a trapping effect um, such that the 
particle won't make it into becoming a larger faceted particle quite so often. Um, so that was quite interesting. I talked a little bit um, earlier on my flowchart about particle characterization, about electron diffraction. I won't go into very much detail, but it's essentially a case of lots of measurements and, and matching up your experimental data with what you're simulating for that diffraction. Um, and yeah, you also want to characterize that it's actually indium, so measure that um, C over A ratio as well. And for the rods, that was quite fun because I could find out uh, that the rod sides were one zero zero, which is definitely not obvious. Um, you could model rods as being 110 as well and who really knows but that that was a good result to find out um and finally i don't think i'll talk too much about the plasmonic response but it's just this peak in the scattering at a, just over 300 nanometers of wavelength it will shift to longer wavelengths if you use a medium with a higher refractive index um, or if you add an oxide layer that will also have an effect. And the particles that I synthesized did have a very slim oxide layer. So that was interesting to model. Um, and that matched up fairly well with the UV vis data. Um, that's there um, shown just about in that range of just over 300. And finally, just to finish off, because obviously I didn't really get to talk about the second half of my project regarding catalysis. So I'll just tell you a tiny bit about um, why these nanoparticles are useful for catalysis. So um, the electrons are oscillating when you're sending your light through and they basically provide some of the activation energy for your reaction. We call them hot electrons. Um, and when they're involved with the mechanism, they've already got some extra energy. And sometimes you can also get an enhancement with the high local electric field. If you have a semiconductor involved with the mechanism and you, you have this high electric field, you'll get more electrons in the conduction band, and that can then be used um, later in the mechanism. So I think that's basically it. Um, I didn't have a sort of thanks slide or anything, but obviously a huge thank you to the group that I was working with um, and to Emily Ringy in particular, who's the group lead for the optical nanomaterials group. And thank you for you guys for listening. <laughs> I hope that was a bit interesting. Yeah, thanks so much for this presentation, Pip. Um, very, very cool and very interesting to me. Um, I'd, I'd have a question about um, how does plasmonics work? So uh, a photon, photon is incident on the nanoparticle and how does how's the energy then transferred onto the, the kind of site of reaction where we need the energy from the photon? And also is the entire energy of the photon um, tr transferred to the reaction or is it some part of it? And what are kind of the timescales? Yeah, so I've never thought of it in a kind of discrete photon manner. I've always considered it more wave in a more wave-like fashion. Um, so to me, it's that you've got this um, oscillation of your electric field and as a charge, electrons interact with the electric field um, mm -hmm. and they form this collective oscillation along the surface up and down. And I think it is just that they then have that extra energy that when something then binds onto that surface and these surface electrons have that extra um, energy that is then involved with the reaction mechanism. But it's not actually enormously well understood. And a lot of the papers about um, plasmonic enhancements of catalysis are to do with the semiconductors that I mentioned, um, because it's more easy to measure. Um, and they did find more conduction electrons because of that electric field. So, yeah. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we have one question on YouTube from uh, Matthew Clark. Um, he says, thank you, that was really cool. Um, are there any other metals equally good at this plasmon resonance? And second question, uh, what makes indium ideal for, for plas plasmon resonance? Yeah, there's um, quite a few. So the ones that were found initially were gold and silver. So gold is when I mentioned cancer therapy um, very good for that application and there's also magnesium is fairly strong and that's kind of the group that I work in is essentially they're magnesium specialists and they're quite excited that magnesium is very cost effective in comparison to these noble metals. I think that um, it would be a lie to say that indium is ideal as a as a like plasmonic um, metal because it 
isn't as cost effective as magnesium. So it's it's cheaper than the noble metals, but it's by no means abundant. Um, Indium for me, it was more about the modeling side, the fact we'd never done BCD before, and the fact that for specific applications, so specific reactions, um, that indium is a very good catalyst for, then if you can have this plasmonic enhancement, it's worth the money to use indium. But I, I don't want to <laughs> leave you with like a false message that indium is a, a godsend of a metal. There are definitely other candidates out there. Yeah. Great, yeah. Um... Thank you very much. Um, great presentation. I uh, will hand over to um, the next next speaker. Um, thank you, Pip. Um, next speaker is Ben Schwabe, and he's a third year um, chemistry student. Um, <laughs> seems to know Pip. Um, he studied biochemistry and chemistry in second year. Um, is at Churchill College. Oh, that's probably why. And he's done a an eight week um, summer project at. Professor O'Reilly's group at the University of Birmingham. And yeah, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Hi there. Um, so yeah, um, so I did my summer project in Professor Rachel O'Reilly's group at the University of Birmingham. And I'm gonna to talk to you today about my project, improving DNA templated synthesis. So first off, um, just as a brief introduction. So in 1995, there were these series of papers which highlighted these sort of interesting and difficult challenges in chemistry. And I'd like to point out unnatural selection and also artificial enzymes as two of these sort of grand challenges which potentially DNA template synthesis might be able to contribute to. So as a quick introduction, uh, change slide, there we go. Um, so we're all very familiar with the double helix structure of DNA. But possibly the most interesting and important thing about DNA is its ability to encode information in its four bases and also the unique base pairing interactions between these. So um, obviously in molecular biology, this information is usually transferred from DNA to RNA and then to protein by trans transcription and then subsequent translation of the RNA. Um, but for DNA template synthesis and other DNA technologies, Usually the most important thing is the ability of DNA to do sequence specific hybridization. So if you have a single strand of DNA with a specific sequence, it will only form a duplex. So it will only form the double helix structure with another very specific sequence of DNA with a complementary sequence. So this has been used for lots of nanotechnology, um, but possibly one of the coolest is DNA origami, where careful design of DNA strands has enabled the creation of these 2D and 3D shapes, such as sort of the smiley face that you can see here, which is very cool. But from a chemist's point of view, the really cool thing would be if you could control the specifics of chemical reactions by combining your building blocks that you want to react together with a DNA adapter molecule, which will confer specificity such that you could do in a, in a complex mixture of building blocks and DNA adapters, you could encode the very specific reactions that you want to occur between two distinct building blocks. Um, so this originally was only done really with one-to-one -one or forming trimeric molecules. So with three building blocks reacting together, but more recent work, um, particularly here on the right, this was the first scheme to really achieve um, synthesis of a short polymer by DNA template synthesis. Um, so this, this used sequential addition of building blocks attached to DNA adapters and also these um, displacement strands to encode the, sequen the, the, the synthesis of this very sequence controlled um, short polymer. Um, it's worth also noting here that it was an insertion mechanism rather than reacting with the end of the polymer chain. And this, would, this kind of mechanism would be compatible with synthesis of much longer polymers. Um, later work, um, has focused on generating autonomous systems, such as this autonomous DNA walker. Um, so, uh, so um, this used um, a, a walker molecule here capable of hybridizing and then jumping across the DNA adapters with the building blocks attached, um, followed by subsequent hydrolysis of that adapter and simultaneously reacting with the building block, attach the adapter such that it would pick them up in a sequential manner 
and they, they produce this tripeptide with a very, uh, with a specific sequence. Um, it's worth noting here that this was reacting at the end of the polymer strand and so is much less well suited for longer polymers and would need to be adapted if that was the, the aim. Um, uh, um, another sort of more complex scheme is shown, shown here. Um, this achieved a very similar thing. Um, so you, you could have um, sequence specific uh, polymerization of building blocks. Um, however, uh, one of the key differences is there's no sort of one master template strand here, but rather the individual strands each encode for the next building block to be added. So the chemistries of the building blocks is also very interesting. So um, some of the initial work used these Wittig adapters and the Wittig transfer reaction, which would normally be carried out in organic solvents such as THF. And they managed to do this in the very aqueous polar solvents that you need for DNA and DNA template synthesis. Um, but the key thing about both of these adapter types is that they use very reactive adapter molecules. And as such, they're very susceptible to hydrolysis. And this was one of the key factors which reduced yield and also reduced the length of polymers that were achievable. Um, so potentially, all of this is with this, the goal of producing longer polymers with um, sequence controlled and attached in some way to the, the template that produced them such that you could do successive rounds of selection and amplification and some sort of mutagenesis such that you could produce synthetic polymers in an, an analogous way to phage display with very specific and um, evolved functionality such that you could optimize them for a huge range of different functions. Um, a generalized scheme for that is shown here. Um, it's worth noting that most of the steps in this scheme are currently achievable and could be very easily imagined how you might do that. But sort of the biggest open questions are with the, the mechanism of DTS um, and how we could actually achieve synthesis of long polymers attached in some way to, <clears throat> to an involvable template. Um, so the main problems here are the hydrolysis of adapter molecules, as I mentioned before, which is where my project focused on. And a couple of other problems which would need to be resolved are that the, the polymers are not attached to the template or they're not attached to an evolvable template. And they also, for these autonomous systems, they tend to be attached to the distal end of the polymer rather than an insertion mechanism, which prevents synthesis of longer polymers as well. So for my project, it focused on trying to characterize and assess DNA as potentially using the DNA, the DNA adapter molecules themselves to protect and prevent hydrolysis of the building blocks attached to them. So this, this um, concept was discovered rather by chance when um, researchers at the University of Oxford, a collaborator with um, Professor Rachel O'Reilly, um, discovered that when they had a thioester, so a very labile group attached to a fluorescent dye on one DNA strand and a, and a DNA strand hybridized to that with an abasic site in proximity, um, they saw a protecting effect. So they saw reduced hydrolysis. I should explain that an abasic site in DNA is a modification such that one of the bases has been removed and the backbone has been modified. So instead of containing a ribose sugar, it was just a, a single sort of a linear carbon chain um, between the phosphates. So my project focused on trying to investigate the interaction between the fluorescent dye and the abasic site and to, to test whether this abasic binding was responsible for the protective effect. So, um, this is the, the basic setup of my, my experiments. So we used um, the same sequences and DNA duplexes that were seen that we used before when the protective effect was first seen. And we wanted to compare DNA duplexes with a single A-basic site where only one of the bases had been modified and removed, or, and also DNA duplexes with a double A-basic site where both base pairs on opposite strands have been removed to produce a larger binding site. And we looked at three different dyes. We looked at Tamra, which is the fluorescent dye where this effect was first seen. And we also looked at pyrene and thiazole orange, 
Um, pyrene is a well-known intercalator into DNA, so it binds between the bases. And thiazide orange is known to both intercalate and previous publications have shown that it can do a basic binding. So we wanted to see using optical spectroscopy, whether we could see preferential a basic binding and whether we could potentially find a dye better than Tamra, which could be used for DNA template synthesis. So I've summarized here very quickly why we chose UV vis and fluorescent spectroscopy. Um, one of those is that these are, are, have very strong absorbances and are innately fluorescent, as you can see from their amazing colors. Um, the other thing is that the, the spectra will change relative to the local chemical environment around that, um, that molecule. They're also very easy to measure and potentially could allow quantification in the future by generation of binding curves. So my first experiments were with pyrene methyl amine. So this is a positively charged derivative of pyrene. And you can see on the right at the top, we have the UV vis titrations. And at the bottom, we have the fluorescence titrations. And the basic setup was we made up a solution of the pyrene molecule. And then we increased the concentration of DNA by adding very small, but very high concentrations of it to the, the cuvette as we were measuring these spectra. And what you're looking at is the changes in the spectra corresponding to the, some of the electronic transitions of the pyrene molecule itself. So for all of these, for the control DNA, the single A basic DNA and the double A basic DNA, we saw very large changes in the pyrene spectra indicating that it was interacting strongly with the DNA. Um, and there are some subtle differences in, in, the, in, the, in the final endpoints of the titration, suggesting that possibly there's maybe a slightly favorable interaction with the slightly more favorable interaction with the abasic DNA. Similarly, for the fluorescence, we see strong fluorescence quenching for all of the DNA um, molecule types. And again, you can see, if I go to the next slide, you can see that the endpoint we get slightly more quenching for the A-basic and double A-basic DNA, um, suggesting that there's a possible weak preference for A-basic binding, but overall the pyrene interacts strongly with all three DNA and so doesn't, isn't necessarily very helpful to us. Um, the next experiments were with um, Tamra. So this was the original dye, which was showed to confer a protecting effect. Um, again, we've got the UV vis at the top and the fluorescence at the bottom. Um, as you can see, there are not big changes here in the spectra of Tamara when we add DNA. Um, and this suggests that there's possibly only quite a weak interaction. Um, this is likely because the Tamara has a net negative charge at pH 7, and so will be repelled by the negatively charged phosphor dice to backbone of DNA. However, we can see there are some small changes in some of these. And given that we know that UV vis tends to be a very sensitive method, this would suggest that there is a possible interaction and these experiments would need to be repeated in triplicate and sort of try and do all the controls to make sure we could confirm that this is a statistically significant interaction. But possibly the most exciting result from my project was with the thiazole orange. Um, so this does bind to both the control and the abasic DNA duplexes again, um, similar to the pyrene. However, the spectra look very different between the control and the abasic duplexes. Um, so at the top, we can see that um, although this, this absorbent starts out lower than the others, um, which is probably a pipetting error on my part, the, the final endpoint is much, much lower than for them for these two, suggesting that there is a difference in the mechanism of interaction. And But the, the fluorescence is probably the most indicative here. So, you can see at the start point, thiazole orange has no fluorescence, and this is to do, to do with the, the conformational um, flexibility of the, the molecule. So it can rotate somewhat around this, this bond here. And so in solution, that rotation prevents fluorescence excitation. But when it binds to DNA, if it intercalates or binds into the abasic site, the, the, the flexibility of the molecule is reduced substantially and allows for fluorescence excitation. And what we can see is that it becomes much more fluorescent with the control DNA than the abasic DNA, which would suggest that it has more um, conformational flexibility when it binds to the abasic DNA, which is what you would expect if it was in an abasic site, which is larger and potentially allows for more rotation. So this suggests that there's a strong preferential 
interaction and a strong preferential binding into the abasic site, which is very exciting. So in summary, um, we demonstrated that optical spectroscopy could show, could demonstrate that molecules, or could we could identify molecules which show preferential binding to an abasic site. Um, my preliminary results suggest that Tamara is not a strong abasic binder. And this suggests that we could find other molecules with better binding and as such a better protecting effect when combined with DNA template synthesis. Um, we verified that thiazole orange is an effective abasic binder and it shows strong preferential binding into the abasic site, which is very cool. And future experiments could incorporate thiazole orange into the DNA templated synthesis reactions and see if it can confer even better protection from hydrolysis than Tamara does. Um, so I'd like to thank um, the Royal Society of Chemistry for funding my project, um, Professor Rachel O'Reilly, and a massive thank you to Jennifer, who was my supervisor day to day and did a lot to help me out. And thank you very much for listening. Thanks a lot, Ben, for your amazing presentation. Um, out of a question to kick off, um, when when you found that there is intercalation, is that actually beneficial to um, RNA template synthesis or do we rather want uh, covalent bonding or some other form of bonding? Um, so the, the protecting effect has only been seen when there was an abasic site adjacent to um, the, the hydrolyzable group. So there, there have been some other experiments by a PhD student in the group who's comparing the protecting effects seen when you add pyrene because we know that it will intercalate well. So if you don't include an abasic site, but you have pyrene instead of your fluorescent dye, potentially we wanted to see whether, um, whether that could also confer a protecting effect. Um, I'm not entirely sure on the results of that, but I think it confers much less because there's less space in the hydrophobic core of the DNA duplex when there's no abasic site. And so potentially hydrolysis will be much much less well prevented in that in that scenario. All right, yeah. thank you. Um, any questions from the, the chat here? I have one from YouTube. Um, Matthew Clark says, thank you for the fascinating talk. I was just struggling to visualize what does the fluorescent molecule physically do as a protecting group after becoming intercalated inside the helix? So um, in this way, the idea is that when you have your your DNA adapters and your building blocks, they'll be covalently bound to your DNA backbone. And so if you have um, your, your reactive group that you want to do the polymerization reaction, and then if you have adjacent to that, covalently bound to it, the fluorescent dye. So it's like a covalently bound thing. And what that will do is bind back around and into the abasic site. And the idea is that it will take with it into the, the, the core of the DNA, it will take that reactive group into it and protect it from solution and as such, hopefully prevent it from hydrolysis. All right, yeah, thank you very much. And we have one more question in the chat. Um, Makoto asks, if you don't mind, can you explain what DTS is? Sorry, I'm not familiar with selection process. Um, okay, so if I come back to, uh, to these, these slides here. So the idea of DTS is that you, have your building blocks attached to DNA adapters with a very specific sequence. And by combining, combining these together using a template such as for the DNA walker and your adapter molecules, you can control the order in which your, your monomers will be com combined into a polymer. And then the goal is that in the future, you could um, produce like a whole library of these with different sequences. And then by some selection procedure, such as the affinity binding, which is used for phage display, you could select the polymers with desirable functionalities in some way. And then by doing some sort of PCR amplification or another amplification process followed by uh, a mutation step, you could um, create an optimized polymer by cycling through this process in a very similar way to how sort of natural evolution might sort of generate interesting mutations and then you sort of test to see whether those are advantageous. And if they are, then they get enriched. And then through that same process, you might be able to evolve new polymers using sequence specific polymerization. Great, uh, thank you very much for clarifying that again. And um, 
Yeah, with that, we'll wrap up your talk. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, and we'll hand over to Daniel Leon. He's a uh, second year Fersnetsky at Trinity College. And he'll talk about um, the two photon absorption process in organic photocatalysis. Um, yeah, hand over to you. Thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you today for coming to my presentation. Um, this summer, I've had the privilege to work with Dr. Yu Jiesun at the University of Cincinnati, um, as well as my mentor, Guan Qin, on um, utilizing this nonlinear optical process called two photon absorption, I'm um, seeing its applications in organic photocatalysis. And without further ado, I will present here is my framework uh, for the presentation today. The initial presentation that I prepared was for the group and it was about an hour long. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about uh, everything, of course, and uh, I will leave out some minute details. So the things in red is what I'm going to be talking about today. Okay, what is two photon absorption? Um, so two photon absorption is a nonlinear optical process in that um, it, you can only see it under high intensity um, conditions such as lasers. It was first postulated in 1931 by Maria Jepp Mayer, um, but it was only verified 30 years later when the laser was invented. Um, and since then, in the past two decades, we have seen a lot of applications in biology and chemistry and material science, data storage, um, all of which have found use for this two photon absorption process, but yet to, we have yet to see it in photocatalysis, which is why our group uh, wants to probe this area. So uh, two photon absorption occurs um, via this, this scheme on the right, I'll show you. So for normal one photon absorption, the photon that you need needs to be higher in energy than the energy difference between the excited state and the ground state of your molecule. What two photon absorption allows us to do is exactly what the name says. We use two photons to achieve the same electronic transition, effectively having the energy of the photons we need to use um, and doubling the wavelength. And I'll explain later why this is very important. For each molecule, the thing that's most important for its two photon absorption ability is the cross section denoted sigma two. It's a measure of how, uh, how well a molecule can simultaneously absorb two photons to achieve some electronic transition. And very importantly, when we want to um, identify that something is a two photon absorption process, we need to check for this I square dependence. Um, and there are various different methods we can, we can go about doing that. Uh, speaking um, directly about molecular two-photon absorbing chromophores, a lot of research has gone into optimizing the two-photon absorption cross-section, sigma-2, um, at various wavelengths in order to achieve different applications. Um, so from the research, we have realized that um, the most important aspect in uh, maximizing the sigma-2 value of a molecule is to ensure that the molecule has large intramolecular charge transfer. Essentially, you want electron density from one end of the molecule to be able to move to another end um, in the electronic transition. That effectively generates a dipole moment, and that dipole moment is, is what interacts with the oscillating electromagnetic field of the photon. So ways we can enhance the intramolecular charge transfer include increasing the pi conjugation of a molecule. So here you see molecules with more extended pi systems. Um, you can also enforce the planarity of the molecule. Here we have a fluorine group, making sure that the, the p orbital overlap is extremely effective. And um, another thing is having electron donors and electron acceptors in your molecule. Essentially, you have a um, donor center homo and electron, uh, no, uh, an acceptor center lumo, so that electron density moves from you know ends of the molecule into the center or from one end of the molecule to another, and this is all summarized in the three motifs that are very well explored by um, by chemists: the dipolar, quadrupolar, and octopolar motifs. Um, and then on the top of this box, I have the two photon absorption cross-section maxima, so where, at what wavelength uh, this value reaches is maximum, and um, that the wavelength is below that. 
Moving on from there, we know uh, we want to see how 2 photon absorption can be used in photocatalysis. Traditionally, um, photocatalysis is done using either UV light or near blue visible light. And although these provide um, high energy photons um, that is capable of creating those electronic transitions, the problem, there's many problems that are associated with them. The, uh, their high energy would lead to often poor selectivity um, and it also is uh, absorbed by many of the other species in your solution. What two photon absorption allows us to do is, as I mentioned, half the energy, double the wavelength, and let us use now red or even near infrared light um, to achieve the same electronic transition, but using two photons instead of one. And there are various benefits that come with um, using NIR light. I've listed just a few. And um, most importantly, it allows us to use more of the electromagnetic spectrum um, in order to perform different photocatalytic reactions. On the left here, I have a schematic of um, how two photon absorption can go on to dry photocatalysis. Your excited state uh, photocatalysis here is a ruthenium center because our group was also interested in ruthenium, uh, ruthenium polypyridyl complexes. But this is this applies generally to any photocatalyst. So after it achieves its excited state, it can either transfer its energy to some other molecule like uh, oxygen to generate singlet oxygen, or it can undergo an electron transfer event to either oxidize or reduce your substrate. Um, so yeah, essentially all of this is activated by an absorption of two photons. And, and with that, we can use NIR light to achieve the transition. So moving on to my own work, I'd like to talk about where I was inspired uh, to, to start from. Here I have two organic photo redox catalysts. They are well published um, and they are widely used in various organic reactions. And these will absorb one photon in either the UV region or the uh, near blue visible region. And once they absorb this one photon, they often go on to oxidize some sort of molecule um, due to its high excited state reduction potential. So it oxidizes a molecule and it drives some sort of chemical reaction. And these very high excited state reduction potentials mean that these um, it's able to oxidize molecules like benzene, which is very important in the functionalization of benzene. Um, on the bottom left, we have um, functionalization of benzene to phenols or to anilines. And on the right, we have various other reactions that um, these uh, organic photoredox catalysts have been very um, useful for. But the problem is these all absorb in the UV and visible region. So our group's interest is how do we make this two photon absorption active? How do we make it absorb in the NIR region? And going back to you know, the design aspects of it, we see that one thing we can do is increase the pi conjugation of these molecules and then install some sort of donor groups to push electron density which is exactly what we did. So here on the left, we start with some, um, some pyridine. And first we methylate it um, to produce this formal positive nitrogen center, which acts as an electron accepting core. Then we install these styro groups at the end with uh, electron donor methoxy groups. So now it can push electron density from one end of the molecule into the center. And this right here is like a quadrupolar type molecule. So I have synthesized three compounds this summer, um, fully characterized them photophysically, electrochemically, and performed some reactions with them as well. Um, I've named them um, as, follow it, as follows, but I'll just call them either the one-arm, two-arm, or three-arm pyridinium, which is this uh, ni uh, nitrogen, benzene, nitrogen in a benzene ring uh, with a formal positive charge. This is the photophysical data. We see that for one photon absorption, it absorbs in the um, UV and near blue region. And I will point out to you, it has no one photon absorption in the NIR region, nothing beyond 700 nanometers. This indicates that if we want to run a reaction with it in NIR uh, irradiation, and if something does occur, it has, it's very likely that it is actually two photon absorption active and achieve the excited state by a simultaneous absorption of two photons instead of one which is exactly what we did. On the very top, the, um, the blue NMR curve, uh, this is done with blue light, uh, 456 nanometers, where it absorbs one photon. 
after only one hour of irradiation, we see complete reaction of um, this, this benzyl amine homocoupling reaction. I should have explained that the reaction we're running here is um, the, the homocoupling of benzyl amine with uh, my compounds that I synthesize as the photocatalyst. It occurs via a single oxygen generation, um, which goes on to oxidize the, the benzyl amine. So yes, the top has occurred via one photon absorption, which shows that under one photon conditions, it does absorb strongly, which is, is, is a good photosynthesizer. It can catalyze this reaction. So that's good. But what about two photon absorption? When we tried all three of these with 850 nanometers, we do see product forming, but only after a very long time. It took about 24 hours for, for us to see uh, any of the, the product peak, which is the B peak um, forming, this B peak right here. Um, and still a large amount of starting material is remaining. Um, although the yields are not very good, this still provides us a proof of concept showing that uh, two photon absorption photocatalysis is actually possible in these molecules. They're able to absorb two photons simultaneously and go on to um, transfer the energy to the singlet ox to create a singlet oxygen and perform the reaction. So building off this work, um, our group is now interested in finding ways to maximize the two-photon absorption cross-section um, and find reactions where you know, we can get a higher yield, um, especially using NIR conditions compared to um, visible light irradiation. So just now I was talking about the pyridiniums, which is a nitrogen center. Now these are the pyrilliums. Um, this is another series that I also embarked on. A pyrillium is a, a benzene ring, but one of the carbon atoms is replaced with an oxygen and the oxygen has a formal positive charge. Um, these pyrilliums, uh, as indicated on the left, are also very good organic photoredox catalysts for oxidation reactions. Um, they absorb strongly in the visible region, and they are actually very easily synthesized, but also very easily um, functionalized. You can actually change the oxygen very easily. Many reactions have been done with this uh, by David Nykswick's group um, from the University of North Carolina. Uh, and so we see that these molecules, they have been published. They are good catalysts, but they all only absorb in the visible region. So we ask the same question. How do we make this two photon absorption active? And with the same reasoning, what we can do is increase the pi conjugation of these molecules, again, installing those styro groups and then putting electron donors at the end. Um, also having this you know, push-pull kind of mechanism going on within the, the molecule. And this is the proposed synthetic route that our group uh, came up with. We have to first synthesize these two precursors. And these two precursors will undergo some aldo condensation and form this pyrillium ring in the center. Um, and this is uh, boron trifluoride acts as a Lewin acid, which is important in the rate determining step, um, causing it to be irreversible and generate the, the pyrilliums um, center um, without you know, having the reversible step. So from that proposed synthetic route, we tried the reaction to create this you know, two arm pyrillium. And unfortunately, um, we were not able to synthesize this molecule. Uh, after uh, just a few minutes of reaction, the whole uh, solution has become completely black, um, which is unfortunate because this was the last thing I did during my summer research because I really wanted to like actually synthesize this molecule and you know have started something new. But um, our group is still uh, very hopeful that this molecule can be synthesized, um, and we're trying different. We're trying to understand why it has um, this reaction has not occurred, and it's likely because this boron trifluoride ether rate that we use. Um, is still contaminated. So hopefully um, I'll hear from the group soon to hear that they have um, the synthesized this molecule. And once we do, we can perform um, some of the reactions that have been previously performed with one photon absorption conditions. But now we can try to do them with two photon absorption. Okay, this is the experimental setup um, for uh, our photocatalytic reactions. Uh, we have these LED lights that irradiate our sample. And uh, for these LED lights, we only have them up to 740 nanometers. So for longer wavelength lights, we have to use these LED strip lights, um, which we you know, uh, insert, uh, circulate around a oil bath. And uh, yeah, so to conclude, 
what I've been doing this summer. Um, there's a lot more that I, I haven't had time to mention, but yes, I've been doing a lot of organic synthesis this summer, and I, it's been very exciting to see that some of the compounds I've made actually are very promising to, to become two photon absorption photocatalysts. Um, and, uh, and we have shown from, from our results that it is possible, although not a lot of yield, um, it's still possible to, to see even better results coming out. Um, and yes, uh, for the pyrillium ones, the synthesis has, uh, has not been, uh, has, still has more work to, to be perfected. Um, but at least we have the idea there and hopefully some good results will come out of it. I'd like to acknowledge my mentor first, Guan Chun, for uh, being very patient with me this summer and teaching me all the skills that I need for the entire group for welcoming here for welcoming me to the group and also um, of course my professor Dr. Yu Jie Sun for allowing me to have this opportunity um, and also be able to present um, this exciting research to all of you. Um, I spoke very quickly so if you have any confusion any questions please do ask um, and I really thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, a, a great presentation and um, very interesting results you showed. Um, I have uh, a question um, about the two photon absorption. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, what are the kind of statistics um, which govern two photon absorption? Because uh, I could imagine if you have one photon um, being incident at the particle at any one time, that's unlikely already. But if you have to have two photons being there at the same time, uh, how much like less frequent does that occur? Um, that's actually a very good question. So I will go ahead back to my first slide. Uh, okay, I forgot to mention, well, I guess I briefly mentioned this. I said the two photon absorption event was only first verified in the invention of the laser. And that's very important because um, the nonlinear non optical processes, they can only really be um, witnessed, observed um, under high in high light intensity conditions. So as I said, the absorption here has an I square dependence. So while we can observe uh, normal absorption, emission, reflection, refraction, all very easily in our daily conditions, um, all these nonlinear optical processes, um, such as two photon absorption and a wide variety of uh, other optical processes, they can only, absorbed when, uh, can only be observed when you have um, either lasers or some sort of high intensity light. We were able to observe it with LEDs. Um, we still have yet to understand uh, exactly why this is possible with LEDs, um, but with the we do see some sort of yield occurring. So it is is possible that um, for our molecules the cross section is high enough to be able to observe the two photon absorption event. Okay, and do we have some like? Can we compare it to the single photon absorption event uh, in terms of the intensity, or isn't there such a such a framework yet? Uh, I do not know direct numbers, but I can uh, guarantee you that any one photon absorption event will immediately uh, cover any two photon absorption event. So if you try to uh, uh, to probe two photon absorption at a wavelength that the molecule does absorb one photon, you will not see two photon absorption. You can't, you can't distinguish that from the okay, one absolutely, absorption. Yeah. All right, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you very much. And then I have a quite a long question from uh, Connor Taylor in the YouTube comments. Mm -hmm. um, he says, hi, Daniel, very interesting talk. Uh, with your pyridinium photocatalysis, uh, you used NIR LEDs, but you previously mentioned that you would need lasers for the required intensity of a reaction. Um, do you have plans to use lasers and would it work better um, work with better yields if you did? That is also very possible. Um, the only concern I have with lasers is that uh, I'm not sure how it would lead to any photo degradation of either the, the, the solvent or uh, any of the starting materials. Um, often photocatalysis is not done with lasers. Um, when you use UV lasers or uh, visible lasers, um, it will lead to a great degree of photodegradation that your product cannot be isolated. 
But uh, come to think about it, since most of the molecules do not absorb in the NIR region, it might be possible to, inc to increase the intensity by quite a bit. Um, and it is very possible that using lasers might have a much better yield. But that, that is something to be explored. So that's a very good question. Thank you. Cool, yeah. And I'd have one more question. Um, so uh, when, you, when you showed this, um, um, your experimental data, when you were looking for two photon absorption, um, mm -hmm. you had single photon absorption at 456 nanometers and two photon absorption at, you were looking at 850 nanometers, I think. Correct. Uh, yeah. So wh why don't you look for exactly half the energy of the single photon? That is actually a very good question. Uh, and I'll give you a, a, a brief answer, but you can always, uh, you can, you can always have this conversation uh, a lot more. But um, a lot of research has been done to, to essentially find out where this two photon absorption cross-section maximum is, at what wavelength that is. Um, it's often a good indicator that you can just double the, the wavelength of the one photon absorption. So in this case, it will be around 900 nanometers that could be very suitable. Um, however, it is the two photon absorption um, event occurs by or more complex, uh, is more complex because there is an additional virtual state that is involved and there might be some sort of additional stabilization of the virtual state um, by the other electronic states in your molecule. So with that, that would often affect where the maximum occurs, either move it a red shift or blue shift it. So it should be around 900 nanometers, but we do not know for certain if it is. I, we chose to use 850 nanometers because the inavailability of uh, certain LEDs, we really only have 660, 740, and 850 nanometer LEDs because um, people off, the companies often don't make uh, IR LEDs um, that are suitable for photoreactions. So once we do find a, uh, a company that does have the LEDs we do, we're going to do a systematic um, approach of uh, probing this, this uh, two photon absorption at various um, wavelengths to see which is the best. But for now, we just picked 850 just because we have it. All right, cool. That makes sense. <laughs> Thank you. And one last question before we uh, go to the next talk. Um, Gian wants to know, is it better to increase the length or the area of the molecule? And also, how does polarity and solvent affect its eff effectivity? Um, so a lot of review papers, I wrote one of them here uh, by, yep. So review papers will often um, talk about the different factors that will affect two photon absorption. And one of which is, you know, increasing the length of the molecule, increasing the pi conjugation. Um, and yes, it does uh, increase the two photon absorption cross section. And oftentimes for, let's say, um, this molecule I have on the screen, if we double the length, the cross section will increase by more than double, which is a, a, is a, an effect called cooperative enhancement. So this is true. If you increase the length of the molecule, you will get a much higher cross section. However, you get to a point when the molecule no longer stays planar and starts uh, having some sort of torsional angle to it. And with that, the, the, the increase for each other length you add is not as high. So with that, the molecules cannot be too long. Not, it will be not as effective um, for each segment that you add. The second part, as you talked about, uh, how does polarity affect it? All of these molecules, they show very strong solvatochromism um, in that changing the solvent that it is, is dissolved in will lead to um, very different, uh, different uh, fluorescence, uh, fluorescence and phosphorescence wavelengths. And it's also shown that if you have different solvents, the cross-section will, will vary with each solvent. There's a lot of papers already published on that. Um, so yes, the solvent that we have done in this research is acetonitrile because it is uh, electrochemically stable. I didn't talk about electrochemical, uh, electrochemical stuff, but um, that's the reason we chose acetonitrile. Um, but if you do use different solvents, you will definitely see a variation in the um, the two thousand absorption cross section, but also the emission maxima. All right, thank you very much, Daniel. Thank um, you so much. Uh, yeah, um, let's continue with the next talk by um, Daniel Wick. 
um, who is a PhD student at the Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology. And he'll tell us something about chemistry and computers. And yeah, I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, let me just share my screen. I hope you can see my screen all right. Yep. Excellent. Right, so I'm really excited to talk to you about how to teach chemistry to computers. Um, I'll talk firstly about how, why do we even want to teach chemistry to computers? Why is it so useful and exciting uh, to research? Uh, then I'll talk about feature engineering, give a case study on feature engineering for movies to better understand how we can do it for molecules. Uh, then brief overview of what uh, molecular representation actually looks like. Um, and then finally, I'll give a one minute overview of a full machine learning workflow for uh, chemistry and how it's made much more accessible using uh, open source Python packages. So why do computers even need to understand chemistry? What's so exciting about it? Um, well, I mean, the first obvious use case, which is already happening now, think to a tool like Reaxis, which is only made possible because of what computers have done for chemists. And really, I think as uh, as computational workflows they improve, we, we can start helping chemists also predicting, for example, the best uh, reaction conditions. Uh, and taking this a step further, rather than having a computer suggest reaction conditions and a chemist do it, what if we could do this in a closed loop? So predict reaction conditions uh, and then feed that to a robot who then does the reaction, feed that back to the machine, retrain the model, suggest a new experiment. And then in that way you can do uh, an optimization loop with no humans involved. Um, looking a step even beyond that, maybe five, 10 years into the future, uh, one thing I think could be really exciting is autonomous discovery. Now, this is you know real artificial intelligence, um, which I don't think exists yet, but this is about asking a bit more of a abstract question. So rather than here's a reaction, find the best conditions, uh, you can ask a question like find the molecule that binds best or find something that can solve this disease, for example. Really abstract and difficult questions to answer that machines can't handle today. Um, but what all, the, what all these use cases have in common is that we need some way to represent the molecules so that um, machines can understand them, specifically machine learning models. Um, and one of the difficulties with this is that we have some molecule, say a, a molecule like this, which is a discrete structure, but to feed it to a model, we need to generate a numerical description. So how do we take something that's inherently discrete and create, say, a continuous numerical description of it? Um, and to better understand this, I've chosen movies uh, to, give, to give an example and hopefully explain this a bit better. So imagine that we're Netflix and we want to cluster movies together to try to suggest the next best movie. Um, we'll then select a, a number of features for movies. So this could, for example, be you know, on a scale of uh, serious to funny on one axis and uh, low budget to high budget on the other. And then we can plot our movies. So for example, The Godfather would be a very serious movie in mid budget. And then by placing all of these movies um, in this 2D plot, we can figure out which movies are similar. Um, so for example, in this particular instance, uh, Free Guy and Shrek would be close to each other. So using a clustering like this, we if we have a new movie uh, that we add to Netflix, which is within this area, within this cluster, we know which users to target with this. Um, obviously this type of clustering is very oversimplified with only two dimensions. And we see the Godfather and Super Size Me being close to each other, which maybe doesn't make so much sense, but hopefully you can appreciate as we add more features, the clusterings become more useful. Um, but really also another key question is how do we select those features? Because we could simply do another type of clustering, say old movies to new movies along one axis, and then long or short movies along another axis. And now I think most would agree, these would not be very helpful features to figure out if a user will like a movie or not. Um, and this, this process of going through what will a good feature be is called feature engineering. And if you've ever heard about how, you know, statistics or machine learning can be biased, this is the reason. This is because 
humans need to decide, well, what will good features be? Um, so while in movies we'll have features like, you know, budget, genre, IMDb score for taking, you know, something very discreet, which is a movie into a numerical description, for molecules, we could have features like density, molecular weight, electron density, and so forth. Um, now, this is one way of thinking about generating a numerical description, but there's actually quite a few different ways. Um, so this, this idea of describing a molecule from its features, uh, I call feature-based molecular representation. Uh, another example of this could be like a fingerprint, for example, which I don't have time to go into exactly how that works, but basically you're looking at the molecular structure and then extracting small subsets of the structure to generate um, basically a bit vector. Um, other examples of molecular representations could, for example, be uh, string representations where you're either uh, just labeling each molecule, for example, with a cast number, or you're making a, a structure-based string representation. So something like a smile string uh, where there's a direct connection from each character in the string to each atom in the molecule. Uh, we could also imagine, for example, a chemical table representation where for your molecule, each atom in the molecule has uh, its coordinates saved in this chemical table. Um, and finally, the newest type of uh, representation are these computer learned representations. Um, and these computer learned representations actually start interacting with some of the other molecular representations. And that's where I think it gets really exciting. Um, so for example, in, in the previous example with uh, you know, movies or molecules, you have a human chemist try to decide which, which features will be important in a computer learned representation, you have a huge amount of training data and then the machine will automatically figure out um, features that describe molecules. Now, the big drawback of this is that it's not really transparent what these features represent. Um, and I'm really excited to see what will come from these computer learned representations because it's still quite exploratory at this stage. Um, but I think that as a logical next step to this, all right, so we have all these different representations of molecules, what can we do with them? So I just go over, maybe spend one minute uh, going through the four key steps of a machine learning workflow for chemistry. So the first step, you want to identify a desired outcome. So uh, this could, for example, be a yield is a popular option or selectivity. You know, you can do this in probably 10 seconds for, for whatever problem you have. The next step is identifying your training data and the correct representation. Now, this is a much harder problem. Um, I've included a figure over here describing some of the different options you have for describing molecules. So at one end, you have something really simple like a one-hot encoding, which includes literally no information about the molecules, but is really quick and simple to do. Uh, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you have, uh, say, density functional theory to generate very descriptive features, but it takes quite a while to do. Um, then after you've, after you've completed this step, you can then go on to your uh, third step and then simply splitting your data set into a chain and a test set. Um, and then that's pretty much done. You're just now going to find, um, use free machine learning packages, which you can find online. So this could, for example, be scikit-learn and then train your models. Um, this can be done quite quickly once you've gathered your data and once you figure out your representation. Um, we're talking, you know, hours to days uh, while, you know, identifying interesting problems and uh, finding the right data and representation can take months. Um, and yeah, after that, you're done. Your model can now hopefully help chemists uh, try to select better reaction conditions for, uh, for the system that they're interested in. Um, and really, if, if I need to leave you with, with one thought about machine learning for chemistry, let it be this. Machine learning and chemistry is all about feature engineering and data rather than about the actual machine learning. All the interesting questions is how, how do I select the features that will describe the system that I'm interested in um, and allow the machine learning models I'm using to extract the information they need to generate a prediction, for, for example, uh, on yield or, uh, or selectivity. Um, and I also just like to say, if you are interested in this topic, please either reach out to me and, uh, and we can talk or also look out for a literature review that I submitted recently and hopefully should be published within the next few months, which really goes into a lot of detail about all the different options we have for molecular representation and how these um, interact with machine learning workflows.
Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank my um, supervisor and co-supervisor, uh, Alexi Lapkin and Jonathan Goodman, the Sustainable Reaction Engineering Group and Syntec cohorts, and um, my funders, UCB Pharma and the Syntec CDT. Um, and yeah, thanks for listening. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Daniel. Um, great talk. Um, I I'd have a question. So um, you talked about um, multivariable um, optimization. And um, is there a, like a certain limit um, in the number of variables we can currently optimize at the same time? Um, so I, there are a few, so you're talking here, your desired outcome. Yeah. Yeah, so there, there are a few like rules of thumb um, for, for generating these workflows. Um, obviously, the more, the more things you're trying to optimize for at the same time, the more complex your problem becomes. Um, but it is definitely, definitely possible to try to, to predict these, uh, these multiple different things. So for example, if you're near using a neural network, um, you, you can't just you know, program it to, to, uh, to predict multiple things at once. But you know, one thing that you need, to, um, you need to keep in mind is whether, whether the data you have supports, uh, supports this. So if your problem becomes too large or if you're using too many features uh, compared to the data you have, then you start overfitting to your data. So, I mean, you asked for you know, outcome prediction, prediction specifically, but say you're using way too many, uh, you want to predict way too many outcomes, you have way too many features. Um, just as a general rule of thumb, you want to have more data than you have features. Um, but if you're in a situation where you don't have that, then the, the model that you train really uh, isn't, isn't that meaningful. Um, I, I don't know if that uh, helps or answers your question. Yeah, that's, that's a good explanation. Um, thank you. Um, and we have one question from YouTube. Um, yeah. Connor Taylor says, um, hi, Daniel, great talk. I just wondered what the most common features would be to describe reactivity in chemistry? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks for your question. Um, so uh, one, um, one thing that I mentioned here on the slide is that you can, you can go up and down in terms of you know, how simple or descriptive it is. Um, so a one hot encoding is literally just ones and zeros for which, uh, which features are there or are not there. Uh, the next step down is an extended connectivity fingerprint. Um, and I think this is probably the most common one used because it is kind of the perfect uh, you know, balance of it's really simple and quick to compute while also having quite a lot of information about the molecule. Um, so I actually, I have a few extra slides because I figure I might put questions like that. Um, so in the extended connectivity fingerprint, what you're doing is you look at a molecule. So the, the example here is leucine, and then you, um, you initialize your mo the, the the algorithm for 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 the ECFP on each heavy atom in the whole molecule, and then you extend out, and then you're able to generate uh, a unique neighborhood, and then each number in this vector represents a neighborhood. So the zeros are saying this neighborhood does not exist in the molecule, and the ones are saying the the neighborhood does exist in the molecule. Um, so with this, you also avoid the bias of what is a good feature? Um, I, I think it was pretty obvious in the movie example, you know, having good features or bad features is actually a surprisingly difficult problem. But when you are generating uh, your features with a fingerprint, you're essentially you know, iterating over the whole molecule um, and you kind of avoid at least some of that bias uh, that you otherwise would have, have built in. All right, thank you very much. Um... And what is what would be your like prediction? Uh, how many years will it take until we have fully automated um, robots, uh, robots who do um, research in chemistry? I mean, automated robots for chemistry is happening in my group today, um, so it, it's already there. Uh, I, I think the 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 question is, what can they handle? Um, so, for example, you can program a robot to do uh, to mix to mix chemicals together for you, right? Yeah. Um, then you could try to take it a step further and do this closed loop optimization. But how how can you make sure that you're actually doing this effectively? So rather than um, rather than just doing a screening of all the 
you know, all the condition uh, combinations you have available? Um, can you actually build, say, a Bayesian optimization model to make sure that you're uh, zeroing in on the best possible conditions so you're not uh, just using a computer for um, uh, to make you know, very expensive uh, experiments, but you're actually using it to generate insight about the next best possible conditions. Uh, I think that's where it starts to become very exciting. And you know, Bayesian optimization for uh, molecular optimization is uh, also a topic I'm interested in. Uh, and um, the, the, the workflows do exist. Um, it's perhaps not as widely used yet, um, but I think you know, when once something is possible in academia, it obviously takes some time. But uh, I think answering these questions of, for example, find the best yield, here are all the solvents you have available, um, uh, I think is possible and, and will become more widespread uh, relatively quickly. Okay, so this is what also falls under closed loop optimization. Um, it's also, it's currently done already. Yes. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. And um, we have one more speaker who is scheduled, um, Sonia, but we couldn't reach him or her. So, um, yeah, I think there's no reply yet, right? Yeah. Um, Gianna Kirsten. Yeah, All right, right. Okay, so that's that's it then for the uh, chemistry session. Thank you very much um, to everyone for tuning in. And um, we'd love to see you tomorrow at the physics session, which will happen in the morning, and the biology session in the afternoon. And there are great keynote speakers as well there. And all the information can be found um, on the Facebook. Yeah, and to the speakers, uh, just stay in the call for, for a little moment. And... Uh, yeah, I'll make some announcements. But thanks to everyone watching and have a good day. Bye bye.